Hi, and welcome to One Hope Baptist Church. My name's Jono. So glad we can join together today for Church Online. We hope that wherever you are today, today's service will be a blessing to you and help you grow in your relationship with God. It was only a week or so ago that our seniors got together and they kind of self-select. All I know about seniors is the morning tea is amazing. Anyway, we just spent a brief amount of time, like eight or 10 minutes, and we did this thing where we all just stilled our hearts and it was quiet and there was some music playing, but we, we prayed to start off with that God invited God to speak to us. And you know what, something incredible happened. It was only a few brief minutes later as people shared of that experience where someone over here talked about how like, they came in so discouraged that they were encouraged just as they heard God's voice. Someone else said, oh, a Bible verse out of the blue came to mind and it, it always encourages me. I feel so much closer to God. And someone even had this incredible picture of like, like, you know, God in all his glory, like right there meeting with them. It reminded me the incredible opportunity we have and how quickly God wants to respond and speak into our hearts and lives. And so that's what we're gonna do today. I'd encourage you to do that wherever you are with the church and we're gonna worship together. God is looking for our hearts. He's wanting to connect with you today. And so we're gonna, in a moment, a little while, we're gonna hear a great message from Pastor Steve. But before that, why don't we just give God the invitation and as we sing together, maybe let these words just really go into your heart and your life that God wants to speak to you. Why don't you give him that invitation today? Things could be really different.
Hey church, Steve here, one of the pastors on the team at One Hope. Great that you could join us online. If that's your regular experience of meeting with One Hope online, welcome again. For the rest of us, we've been used to meeting together in our various campus, our two campuses. Look, this is a little bit going back to what we had before. Unfortunately, this is where we find ourselves. But hey, great that we have this technology and great that you can be with us online today as we go through looking again at God's Word. We've been working our way through the book of Acts in a series we call The Unstoppable Force. And in that we see the birth of the early church. We see God at work doing incredible things, gathering together people from every nation and tribe and tongue as they gather under the banner of the church in a manner reminiscent of the uh, tabernacle of Moses or even the temple of Solomon. We see there when the presence of God filled that place, when the priests couldn't minister because of the presence and the power of God. So it was at the day of Pentecost when wind and fire became the hallmarks reminiscent of the presence of God in in the midst of his people. And here in the New Testament Church of Acts, we again witness that. And, and, And there's flowing over from that unprecedented levels of sharing and of fellowship and commitment are the hallmarks of the church. And it's against that background we come today to a rather controversial, if not shocking, story of a couple called Ananias and Sapphira. And we see how God deals with sin in the church through that story today. But up to this point, of course, God was doing incredible things through the book of Acts. We see the church in a very positive light. It's doing incredible things. They're effectively facing crises both from within and without. And and we see opposition, but we see also the, the spirit of God being poured out upon his people. And as I say, the result of that is people caring for one another and God's adding to their numbers and overall they're doing really well. And one such good news story we here come across in Acts chapter 4. And there we meet a guy called Joseph from Cyprus. You might know him better as Barnabas. We're going to pick up the story in chapter 32 of, sorry, verse 32 of chapter 4. And let's read that together. It said, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. As I say, things were going fairly well in the church and here is a very positive example of best practice of giving and of sacrificially serving other believers. Now contrasted against that example of Barnabas is something something quite the opposite. It's the deception of Ananias and Sapphira who represent the worst of of examples of what was happening in the church at that time. Let's pick it up in chapter 5. As we look into this story, though, before I get to that, I want to explore why it is that God acted with such uh, judgment in the church in a time when grace and forgiveness were the hallmarks of God's people. And I then want to see how that episode might inform the church of today and how we might respond to that story as something that's so confronting. So let's read together in the fifth chapter of Acts. It says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in and not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she replied, that is the price. And Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen. The feet of the men who carried, or sorry, who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. 
At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. And then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So here we see this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who like Barnabas sold a piece of property. But unlike Barnabas, who gave it all to the apostles, they kept back some of that money. And the word translated as kept back in this scripture in the Greek literally means to pilfer or steal or embezzle. But you might object, how is it that you can keep back something which you already own? After all, didn't the property belong to them in the first place? And where's the command in the Bible that actually said you had to sell everything and bring it to the apostles? So you might think in that case it's a bit rich that these people paid for their life for something potentially as minor, if you will, as bringing that whole amount to the apostles. But before we rush too quickly to putting God in the dock and for his actions again in this case, it's important that we perhaps consider a, a background story from the Old Testament where this very same Greek word for kept back is used in the Greek version of the scriptures, the Septuagint. And it occurs in the story of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. Now, as a bit of background before we get to Achan himself, the context of this is in Joshua chapter 6, Israel, the children of Israel have just conquered um, the whole uh, uh, city of Jericho and they've ransacked the city and they've taken the spoils of war. And we're told in Joshua 6.24 this, it said they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. That's really important. And then it goes on in Joshua 7, of eight, speaking of Achan. In his case, it says this, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully regarding the things designated for destruction. Those things designated for destruction are actually holy things, things that were to be consecrated to God and to him only, those things which were to go into the treasury of the Lord's house. It says, For Achan, the son of Kami, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took, in other words, kept back, there's that word, some of the designated things. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. See, Achan's sin was that he took back and held back, stole, embezzled, pilfered things which were rightly belonged to God. They were devoted to God. They were to go into the Lord's, into the treasury of the Lord's house. In other words, they were holy, they were to be set apart, and they were devoted solely to God's house, the tabernacle. And that Luke uses this very same word. It occurs very few times in the Bible, actually. That fact that Luke uses that same word to describe the deception of Ananias and Sapphira, I think, tells us something really quite important. There's a link here. He's, in effect, saying that the wrong use of our possessions is a sin, just as it was uh, approaching that of Achan. But does that mean we should be shaking in our boots if ever we've held anything back to God? Because, after all, who hasn't done that? And if he's not bringing that sort of punishment on us today, why in fact did he choose to do that in the case of Ananias and Sapphira? I think that's a reasonable question. To answer that, I'd say it's really important to consider this in the light of what happened in Achan's story. See, just as the children of Israel were now just entering into the promises of God, into the promised land, having conquered Canaan, uh, conquered um, Jericho rather, God was establishing his people for the very first time in the land of promise. And so it is. This is the earliest days of the church. God is establishing something and he wants it to be holy. He wants it to be set apart. He wants it to be devoted just like he did with Achan, with the children of Israel. So there's a key verse, I think, in Romans 11, verse 16. And it says this, If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now the context of that scripture is the fact that the Gentiles were being grafted into the children of Israel, into the Jewish nation. And speaking of the the Jewish nation being that holy root. So I don't want to misquote that scripture, but I think there's a really important principle at stake here, which is that which grows up in anything that's organic, and the church is organic. It can't be of a different kind from its root or its source or origin. As is the root, so is the fruit. So what grows up is only as healthy as the root system that supports it. And see, as roots go down and they draw up from the soil nutrients and water and oxygen, and they feed up through the branches and into the leaves, and the leaves interact with the sunlight, and so the plant grows healthy, that's how organic things grow. But not only that, those roots, those very same roots, anchor the plant 
And as the plant gets bigger, so the roots need to go deeper and they need to be healthy. In other words, you might say, in the case of the church, holy. And Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God when he talked in Matthew 13 of the mustard seed planted in the ground which grows into a very large tree and the birds of the air come and make their nest in it. In fact, those very, um, that very scripture is speaking about those birds coming. It's, it's a picture of the nations, the very nations and tribes and tongues all coming and making their home as, within the kingdom of God. And just as the root needed to be holy, so the church needs to be holy. So when God speaks of the root being holy, he's saying that that's got to be a prerequisite for the branches to be holy. And there's a really strong message that God was sending to the church and those first believers that it was to keep itself from deceiving and being deceived. Now, I don't know how it is that Peter actually discerned what was going on there with these two. We're not actually told. We do know at Pentecost he was filled with the Holy Spirit and we know about gifts being given. Gifts of prophecy, gifts of discernment of spirits, gifts of wisdom, wisdom and words of knowledge. So I can imagine that the Holy Spirit has revealed these things to Peter. But however it came about, I want to make two brief points about this. And the first is about the devil's part in this whole fiasco. And the second one is about the Christian's part in the, when it comes to deception in the church. So let's turn firstly to the work of Satan in this, the, the role the enemy played. You see, Satan had so filled and controlled Ananias' heart to that point where he was now prepared to act upon a demonic influence. It's somewhat reminiscent of what happened in Judas's case. Peter said to Ananias, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? See, it wasn't some random thought that Ananias had just trumped up out of nowhere. He had opened himself to Satan to such an extent, maybe rehearsed the thought in his mind to the point where the enemy took ground and actually lied and, and, and he led him to lie and to deceive, which of course we know is the native language of the devil. So we need to be realistic about, the, about Satan's capacity to lie and to influence and to deceive and, think, you know, and change our thinking and our behaviour as Paul reminds us that we're not unaware of the devil's schemes. Now we need to be aware but not alarmed. But because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we also know that the devil is a defeated foe, but we do also know that he roams around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. So we need to be really vigilant in keeping watch over our lives and our conduct and not allow ourselves to be open to the influence of the enemy. The second thing to note is this. Satan's activity did not actually take away the responsibility or the culpability, if you will, from Ananias for his actions. While the verse I just mentioned attributes the act of Satan's influence, Peter actually asks in the very next verse this thing, addressing Ananias. He says, what made you, Ananias, what made you think of doing such a thing? He said, you have not lied to men but to God. See, Paul, Peter knew full well what or who it was that had made him think of doing such a thing. He just explained it a moment ago, it was Satan. But see, Peter places the responsibility squarely back on the shoulders of Ananias. So the devil made me do it is no excuse. It's never an out clause when it comes to disobeying God. We choose. And you see, the most serious thing Ananias did was to lie to the Holy Spirit, not actually keep back part of the money. In fact, Peter says to him, wasn't it within your power to actually uh, to do whatever you wanted with this money? And here's the main point, you see. When we lie to the church, we actually lie to the Holy Spirit because, as we know, and as I said at the outset, the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit and the, he is the spirit of holiness. I'll say more about that a little later. But I think it's really important that we remember the main player in this game really is the one who's manipulating things behind the scene, which of course is Satan. Ananias and Sapphira are just secondary players in it because we see Satan rising up in opposition and against the working of the church because God is birthing something very powerful and very real. And in Acts, we see the devil's first tactic was to attack the church from outside. We see opposition, we see persecution, we see trumped up charges, we see all manner of things of the enemy being at work from outside. But then his second tactic, and this is more surreptitious, this is when the enemy seeks to destroy the church from falsehood on the inside. And that's why that sto this story is just as relevant as it is today. The circumstances might be different, but there is a principle here. So turning again to these secondary actors, Ananias and Sapphira. As I mentioned earlier, giving everything wasn't mandatory. The issue for this couple was they just wanted recognition. They just wanted to look good. 
they were acting in falsehood. And so they pretended they were a bunch of hypocrites, a couple of hypocrites. So they wanted to impress by giving the appearance that they were doing something that they weren't. In fact, they, the fact is that they weren't and they paid for it with their lives. So they were dying for attention, you might say. The contrast against this attitude was that of Barnabas, which was in full view to the church. But here Ananias and Sapphira weren't fooling Peter and they certainly weren't fooling God. And so as the story plays out, first Ananias and then Sapphira, they fall down dead following Peter's discernment of what they're up to. And the news of that death spread like wildfire. And it says there in verse 5, great fear seized all who heard what had happened. That was after Ananias had copped it. And then once Sapphira got her dues, it's repeated again in verse 11. So that's the outworking. That's what's being refer- reinforced here is the fear of God. In the right sense of that word, if you cast your mind back to the series we had on Deuteronomy recently when we unpacked about the fear of God. See, fear was the main outcome of what was going on here. That was the outworking of all of this. It was this fear of displeasing God and it was a graphic reminder both of the God's holiness and also the consequences of sin. Remember the dough being offered as first fruits had to be holy. See, another thing I observe from this story is that the church in Acts was not perfect as it is today and as it's always been throughout its history. So that, of course, is directly relevant to us. But the early church, under Peter's leadership, immediately dealt with the problems they faced. See, God was on mission. And as we've seen before and immediately before this story and immediately following it, the church began to expand. And it's episodes like this that were not about to hinder its growth. And in the period following this incident, we see that the apostles were performing miracles and believers were being held in high esteem. And we see the church increasing. The branches growing out from that root were in fact holy. So let's get really practical. What do we make of all of this? What lessons can we learn from the sad demise of this first century couple? I think the first relates to the use of possessions. So number one is this. Invest in true riches. So there are many examples from Scripture reminding us of the dangers of wealth, like how hard it can be for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, there's almost 20% of the gospel material given over to financial stewardship, and one in every three parables relates to the matter of money. And the reason why Jesus deals so comprehensively with money matters is because money matters. In fact, for some of us, it matters perhaps just a little bit too much. And the fact that we cannot serve both God and money, as it tells us in scriptures, should tell us that when our affections for God decline, in direct proportion, our affections for money, or at least the money things buys perhaps more accurately, uh, grows. And it assumes a godlike quality in our lives. It, the money becomes our ticket to significance. And we seem to have this tendency to want to create a name for ourselves by acquiring stuff, or at least trying to do something that will outlive us. But remember, the scripture says it's the love of money, not money itself. It's the love of money, which is the root of all kinds of evil. It always lurks, always there at our doorstep, wanting to have us. And if our love for God grows cold, strangely, our love for stuff increases. The object of our worship subtly changes. And Paul warns of that danger when he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. He said, those who want to get rich... That's where your heart's invested. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You see, it's not that we're not investing. We all invest. It's just a matter of where we invest. The fact is, if used correctly, money can be a wonderful slave. If used incorrectly, it becomes a terrible master. And the antidote to avoid those sorts of trappings of wealth is the example of the early church that we read before in Acts chapter 4, and specifically in verse 32. To repeat that again, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. You see, the fact is that the first Christians were one in heart and one in mind. They were open-hearted. They were open-handed. They were generous. And that's how we are to be with our possessions that God gives us, whether they be great or whether they be small. If we're to avoid the many pitfalls that attach themselves to wealth, it comes down to our attitude toward it. And see, contrasted against this background of the early church uh, where Barnabas is giving and that scripture I just read is you've got Ananias and Sapphira. And see, the big deal for them was their pride. 
they just, as I said, they wanted to look good. Their hearts were out of alignment with the will of God and they had no idea about what it meant to make an investment in true riches. And so they resorted to deception. And sadly, in the church today, we still see scandals involving the misuse of funds and it's, it's an indictment on the church. And we need to keep a right perspective by investing in those true riches, as I say, the things of eternal value. So that's my first lesson, that first takeaway from this message is we need to invest in true riches. The second thing I take out of today is this. this, this deception destroys our unity. It destroys our unity in the church. As I said earlier, when we lie to the church, we in fact lie to the Holy Spirit because the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember how just a few chapters earlier at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been poured out. Fire falls on the church in a manner reminiscent of that Old Testament tabernacle or temple. And see, God wasn't messing around. He was moving powerfully and he needed a church that was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was no place in it for sin. And so it is for us. Out of our love for Jesus, we need to love his church, the bride of Christ. And honesty and transparency in our dealings with one another are crucial if we expect to have an impact in, in the world around us and have the power and the presence of God amongst us. In 1 John 1, 7, it says this, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, that's God, we have fellowship with one another. You see, our fellowship or our sense of community is only seen when we all choose to walk in the light together. But if we lie, it's like a cancer in the body. When we lack truth, we lack authenticity. And as a church, if lies and deception are left unchecked, that church becomes superficial and powerless. And it's on its way to decline and irrelevance. So let's together make that commitment to walk in the light as he is in the light so that we can have true fellowship with one another. So the world's watching and it's relying on us to reveal his light and not just not cast a shadow of darkness. The third thing I see from this is this. Number three, we must deal with sin. You know, it's a bit of an unpopular message in an era of almost anything goes when there are very few moral absolutes, it would seem. I mean, who are we to pontificate about what's right and what's wrong and pass those judgments to make a decisive stance on certain matters by informing any form of what we might call church discipline? Now, I'm not advocating a boots and all approach. I mean, we all need grace. We all need forgiveness because we all uh, do the wrong thing from time to time. But we must confront those things which are a sin against the body of Christ, his church, those things that have far-reaching consequences. Because if we don't, the body will lose its peace, it will lose its power, and the blessing of God is withheld, as we've seen even today. But wouldn't we rather be like the early church who were of one heart and of one mind, where God was present amongst them and doing incredible things. But not only that, if sin that is within the body of Christ isn't confronted, the chances of healing for the one who has sinned, that person, who uh, is greatly reduced. Now I get it, it's convenient to just maybe turn a blind eye. It's a whole lot less painful to just ignore the problems in the church and hope they'll go away or perhaps uh, hope they'll never ever surface, and stay buried. But the problem with that approach is that we, we let this deadly cancer into our community life that would just eat away at our spiritual vitality. Now I must say right here, I'm not addressing any specific matter in the life of One Hope or any church anywhere for that matter. We're just trying to be true to the scripture today and let it speak for itself. It's a general principle that we're trying to bring out here. But look, I think it is comforting to at least know that this early church had its challenges as well, but they dealt with them very decisively. So remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 where there's this man who sins against the body and it, Paul in fact says to him in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, this sinful man, he says, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord. It's pretty harsh words, but you know, underpinning all of that is that his, his spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord. See, underpinning all of this is restitution. Underpinning all of this is grace. There's still a place for church discipline, particularly for people in positions of trust. But like a child that's been chastened by a parent, the pain and the humiliation of such discipline should mean that well, that person will think twice about going down that same pathway again. Just like that guy in Corinthians. And if you read in 2 Corinthians, you'll see that that brother was in fact restored to fellowship again. And that's the aim of the game, right? So discipline's meant to correct and people are meant to respond constructively to it. And hopefully when they do, they'll avoid everything they can to go down that same old path again. Because there's freedom that comes with forgiveness from walking in the light, 
the church discipline and these things are there to protect us and to keep us from another fall. But can I say that, a very word of caution here, we need to apply church wisdom with great care, with wisdom, with discernment, discretion and love and grace because we're all impacted by the fall. None of us are beyond this stuff. And Paul, I think, says something quite pertinent in Galatians 6 where he says this, If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, or another version says you who are spiritual, in other words, those who have, I guess, spiritual discernment, they should restore that person gently. There's that word again, restoration. But then it's a warning. It says, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. See, none of us are beyond this stuff. But we are called to deal with the big issues that threaten to disrupt the unity in the body of Christ. The key to doing that, of course, is, is doing it with a fear and reverence for God. Which brings me to my final observation from today's passage. Number four is this. We need reverence for God. So the idea of going through life fearing both God and the consequences of sin is not a popular message in our current day. So generally speaking, fear is a bad feeling to be avoided at all costs. But it doesn't have to be that way. See, we can embrace fear as a friend, a friend that will alert us to the danger of sin. And if we fear God or we have this reverence for him, then we'll have a right orientation to the joy that comes from knowing him. And we will, we will appropriately fear the loss of that joy if we break fellowship with him by sinning against him. See, those who find pleasure in sin see fear as a spoiler of fun and of good feelings. But far from being the ultimate killjoy, God is in fact the true source of full, full joy, of lasting and truly satisfying joy. And so fear, the fear of God becomes the gateway to joy. And when we fear the holiness of God and the consequences of sin, we're going to avoid sin. We won't spend our days wishing we could have sinned a bit more. Instead, we'll be grateful that we escaped the entrapment that would come from disobeying God. And instead of running towards sin, we'll run away from it and into the arms of God, the source of true joy. And like David in the Psalms, we've said this, this should be our mantra. It says, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. May that be a scripture that resonates with us. So then the fear of displeasing God, as I say, is the gateway to true and lasting joy. As the Bible defines it, it should be our friend and as our friend, we should embrace it. So there you have it, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It's a story that might seem a little bit obscure to us, uh, but I think it still has a lot to say to us in the present day. Firstly, how we use our resources. It's really important. Secondly, the importance of truthfulness, of walking in the light, of being truthful and honest with one another. The third thing about the importance of preserving community, of course, sin disrupts that. And finally, the reverence that we need to have for God. See, I think all these things are directly relevant to us today. So let's learn from this unfortunate demise of this couple in the, in the first and early church by, by, and live our lives in such a way that pleases God. And rather than dying for attention, as Ananias and Sapphira did, let's humbly serve our church in a way that maintains and serves the unity within our community because building community is one of our core values here at One Hope. And we need to invest in that. And we need to be intentional about it. And we need to learn from today's story that that unity that in, within our community is so easily disrupted by sin. And so we should work together to preserve it and to build it and to align our priorities with God's and to commit to honouring Him in all things. So let's pray together as we conclude. Loving Father, teach us today to have a reverence for you, to have a holy fear of you and an understanding of the consequences of sin. So Lord, we would live in such a way as to please you. Lord, give us the power both to will and to do according to your good pleasure. That, Father, you would work within us a desire to obey, to love and to serve. That, Lord, we might walk in the light as you are in the light. And that, Father God, you might give us this commitment to maintaining the unity within our community here at One Hope and Beyond. Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who is to be praised forever. Amen. Hey God, we thank you that you are not far away, but you sent the Holy Spirit to come dwell amongst us and be with us, be our helper and to be our guide. And that is just so loving. And we thank you for that. We thirst for your presence. We thirst for your presence. We don't want to miss anything, Lord. Don't let us miss it. See, there's nothing worth more 
I love what God was saying through that message by Steve, dying for attention. And how's this? How he encouraged us to, um, you know, that we can all do our part to help set the tone for community. And we not only bless other people, most importantly, we please God by the way that we choose to live and how we allow God to shape our character and our convictions. I hope that that message is something you can take into your week and be encouraged by. Just a couple of practical things. If you are watching right now at our 9.30 a.m. stream, teenagers, you can connect with One Hope Youth, the lounge after this. You can just simply uh, follow the links on uh, Linktree. Otherwise, you can check out our socials. The info would have been posted there in the last couple of days. Also, if you're a family with young children, don't forget you can check out the One Hope Kids Facebook page where there's some activities that you can enjoy in your own time. Finally, if you feel like you've uh, maybe God's shown you something this morning or you want to uh, take the next step in your relationship with God today, then can we invite you and we would ask you, connect with us, info at onehope.org.au or otherwise you can message us on social media. We'd love to help you grow in your relationship with God. Finally, whatever you got planned this week, wherever you are, we are the church. God has promised to do amazing things in our life through the gift of Jesus Christ. And so we can celebrate that tonight. We look forward to seeing you next time where we can join all together. Have a great day, church. kids well here we are again a week of remote learning and lockdown you've totally got this guys we love you and we are praying for you more lap kids you've been learning about honoring your mum and dad this term which is so awesome did you know that that is one of the ten commandments that God gave Moses and the Israelites in the Old Testament last week at Barabul we learnt about the Ten Commandments as well. In fact, we learnt a way to remember them off by heart using our fingers. And so I thought that we could look at these again to lock it in the minds of our Barable kids and to include our Moolat family too. Isn't it cool that God gives us Ten Commandments? Because we've got Ten Fingers. If there were 12, how would we count them on our fingers? We'd have to do 10 fingers and like two toes. And well, that just wouldn't work because I don't know about you, but I can't hold up two toes. If you can, you need to take a photo and send that to me because I need to see it. Now, when we're learning about the Ten Commandments, it's important to know that the Ten Commandments were not given to God's people so they could earn God's love and favour. No way. God had already freed the Israelites from Egypt, proving that he loved them. The Ten Commandments were given to God's people to help them remain in his love. Not to earn his love, but as a response to his love. So today, I'm going to teach you how you can remember the Ten Commandments off by heart, not so you can earn God's love, Uh uh-uh. Living by these rules is simply a way of us saying thank you to God and showing him that we love him through the way that we live. Okay, so here we go. Get your fingers out. Ready? Number one, there is only one God. You remember this one by just putting up one finger. One God. Number two, do not have another God before me. So you put up two fingers and put one in front of the other. Don't put another God in front of God. Number three, do not use the Lord's name as a swear word. You put your three fingers in front of your mouth to help you remember not to use God's name in a way it shouldn't be used. Mm -mm. Number four is keep the Sabbath holy. You do this by using two fingers from each hand, putting them together like a church because we go to church on Sundays. Well, when we're not in lockdown anyway. Number five, honour your parents. We remember this one because when we obey our parents, they give us a high five for a job well done. Number six, do not murder. We remember this one by taking our thumb and tipping over all the others. 
do not murder. <laughs> Number seven, do, do not commit adultery. Now, this is a pretty grown up word, but what it means is married people, these guys over here, lovey doveys, they stick together and they don't mix with the others. Do not steal is number eight. And we remember this one by taking our five fingers and grabbing these three like we're stealing them. Do not steal. Number nine, do not lie. Now we do, we remember this one by taking all nine of our fingers and covering our mouth. Do not lie. Now number 10 is do not look at what other people have and wish that it was yours. We remember this by taking our 10 fingers and making binoculars to remind us that we do not look at what other people have and wish it was ours. Now that's it, that's the 10 commandments. You can watch this video again to practice it and then get your family members to test you. You can read the 10 commandments with your parents and carers to check that I've got them right. It's in Deuteronomy chapter five, verse six to 21. Now remember kids, we don't obey these rules to earn God's love, no way. He's already proven he loves us. We obey these rules because we love him. Well, that's it from me, guys. Enjoy your week at home. We really hope to see you in person next week. But today, you can access some activities on our website or on our Facebook group. So we hope you enjoy those and we'll see you next week. We love you guys. Hello Women of One Hope, Nicole Riddle, Bloom Women's Ministry Leader here. Now it's time to get together again. We would love the opportunity for us all to reconnect, both with each other and our amazing God. Why don't you invite a friend and join us on Saturday the 5th of June, 7 p.m. at Barrable Hills Campus. We're gonna have a cuppa together, some fellowship, amazing worship. We'll encourage one another and pray together. We are thrilled to be meeting again in person and we know that many of you have also missed the opportunity to do this. So please register for this free event via Linktree, Slice or the One Hope website. Just head to the events page. We look forward to sharing in this special time with you as we continue pursuing God. Can't wait to see you there. Hi Church, Jess Spicer here, one of the leaders of our In The Womb ministry. This ministry encompasses more than just supporting women who are currently pregnant. Our heart is to stand alongside families through every stage of conception and pregnancy. We recognise that there are families in our community who are struggling with conception or recurrent miscarriages, and often they struggle in silence. Particularly in this season of social distancing and separation, we want you to know that you're not alone. We would love to support you, love you, comfort you and pray for you. On Tuesday the 8th of June, 7pm at our Barrable Hills campus, we'll be holding a night of prayer and support specifically for women who are experiencing challenges in conceiving. We understand that everyone's journey is different, so no matter how long you've been trying for, we want to stand alongside you and believe with you for that precious miracle. So to register, please head to the One Hope Linktree page. And to our wider church community, you may not know these families personally. However, I would encourage you to be praying for them too. Let's stand together as a church family and believe for God's blessing over them. Thank you.